Good day, and thank you for joining us for this Opportunities for Collaborative Planning to Meet Community Needs webinar. I'm Lori Benner, Associate Vice President of Programs with the National Fair Housing Alliance, and we are pleased to offer this session in partnership with our Keys Unlocked Dreams Initiative and the Housing Solutions Lab at NYU Furman Center. Keys Unlocked Dreams is a three-year, 10-city initiative designed to close the racial homeownership and wealth gaps. Part of this work includes examining systemic issues and policies that perpetuate disparities. Never before has the connection between health and housing been so critical. We hope to start a conversation about how practitioners can work together to create comprehensive solutions. You may notice that there's a poll available, so please be sure and respond if you've not already. And with that, I would like to turn the mic over to Martha Gavez. Hi, thanks so much, Lori. I'm Martha Galvez. I'm the executive director of the Housing Solutions Lab at NYU Furman Center. And thanks to everyone who's long, logged on today to hear uh, this conversation. So the Housing Solutions Lab works with cities across the country to design and evaluate evidence-based equitable housing policies that promote health and community well-being. We know that housing is a key component of individual and community health. And a priority of ours is to help find ways to connect housing and health practitioners. So we are really delighted to co-host today's event with the National Fair Housing Alliance to talk about ways to do this through collaborative community planning. So we'll begin with a brief presentation from Joe Schilling, who's a senior research associate at the Urban Institute. Uh, you can read more about Joe and find bios for all of our panelists in the handout link that is in the chat. We'll then transition to our outstanding panel and discussion moderated by James Hardy, a senior program officer for uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Thank you so much, James, for joining us and for moderating today. Our work at the Housing Solutions Lab is made possible with support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Uh, so I'd like to uh, thank them for their ongoing support as well. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to Joe to, to begin. Thanks, Martha. And thanks, Lori, for pulling this all together. And Camille, this is uh, a great opportunity to explore that health and housing connection. So my goal today really is to kind of lay the foundation uh, for this conversation by connecting some dots, as they say. Let's see. There we go. So in thinking about the relationship, as Martha alluded to, certainly the social determinants of health is a term that we are very familiar with when it comes to the built environment and housing. But many of us who may start it out in the health and built environment field, uh, myself as background in urban planning, didn't know a lot about public health, or we find folks who have been working in the public health sphere for many years and are just now trying to understand what goes on in the housing policy ecosystem. So again, today our opportunity to try to build those bridges and develop that stronger connection. So we're gonna be looking in depth more at the community health needs assessments, which those of you, so I looked at the poll, it seemed about 40% of folks uh, have been involved with a CHNA and looking at the poll again, there was again, 40 some odd percent were involved with different housing planning tools, uh, either an AFH or consolidated plan or maybe a housing element in their comprehensive plan. So what I would say is this is in some ways more of a crash course uh, in outlining these different frameworks. What we did as part of the Keys to Unlocking Dream initiative is 
do just a brief scan, not a comprehensive inventory, but a brief scan of CHNAs and tried to understand, well, what's the landscape around these planning processes? You know, who does them? How often? Uh, what do they say, if anything, about housing? And on the flip side, for those in the housing field, you're very familiar with the affirmatively furthering fair housing rule and the planning tools that are involved with them. So again, what do they say about health, if anything? So again, just a real basic orientation to set the stage for this conversation. So with community health needs assessments, it's interesting in that these requirements come from the Affordable Care Act, the ACA, um, and it requires hospitals and healthcare institutions every three years to go through this process. Uh, but curiously, the requirement comes as from the IRS. So this is not necessarily connected even to health policy, but the nonprofit status of, how, of health uh, care institutions. So they go through this process every three years and as uh, similar to other types of health assessments, a lot of data collection in order to let's identify within a particular region, um, you know, what are the health needs and issues so that hospitals and healthcare institutions can adjust the provision of services. So what we found as we did this scan is there's many of the assessments are done with extensive partnerships with a wide range of institutions, nonprofits related to obviously healthcare, but that might include homeless providers, it might include a wide variety of uh, education organizations who are looking through the lens of health, uh, as well as a wide variety of healthcare providers. Extensive quantitative and qualitative research is a pretty extensive community engagement component, uh, as one would imagine, and looking at the healthcare assessment, the needs from a regional perspective. Well, what we did find in terms of housing and those that identified social determinants of health as one of their top priorities is there was a big focus on what we would say sort of mixed income housing support um, and, and the housing support services that go uh, with that type of housing. But what we also found is that housing, when it comes to the final ranking of priority issues may not necessarily be selected uh, as one of the top three health, uh, health needs for a region. So as you can see with this quote here from the Detroit region, certainly it was an issue that came up, but from I think the health care provider's perspective, well, there's really difficulty in trying to increase access or increase the supply of housing because those aren't the policy levers that healthcare institutions uh, have responsibility for. So it wasn't chosen as a priority. But yet, as we mentioned, this sort of social determinants of health, right? That if you're looking at housing as really the cornerstone for uh, for public health, whether that's availability to green space and parks, makes life easier in terms of active living, access to healthy food. So all of these social determinants of health that sort of revolve around stability and shelter uh, come to the forefront, as this quote illustrates from the CHNA in the Columbus Regional Healthcare Systems Plan. So a couple of examples here, and again, there were many to choose from. We chose the most recent one from Southeastern Pennsylvania, which is Metro Philly, because it was kind of an interesting approach and it's a good illustration of the partnerships and the process. So this was a regional plan that involved 
a number of hospitals. Uh, it involved the public health, the Philadelphia Health Department, and it was sponsored along with the Healthcare uh, Improvement Foundation. Uh, it was convened by Housers. It was convened by some of our uh, colleagues, Rick Sauer and his team at the Philadelphia Association of CDCs. And they helped bring together sort of the housing and health care stakeholders to really do a deeper dive on their CHNA and this connection to health. So it really does illustrate that you're starting to see in CHNAs more attention given to health. So this just gives you a brief overview of their framework. You notice that there's a lot of behind the scenes analysis and data collection. There's also in some ways a classic strategic planning process that they have to go through. You know, the guidance for CHNAs talks about you know, defining the community, collecting the data, prioritizing the issues, and doing that with extensive stakeholder involvement. And in Philadelphia, that was the stakeholder involvement that PACDC was trying to pull together in order to rank those priorities. They had quite an elaborate process in terms of the teams and how the data was collected, uh, and then how those how that data was then uh, supplemented by the community um, outreach and input. Housing did come up. Um, it was listed as priority number eight in Philadelphia. And those of us who have worked in Philadelphia know that for uh, on the housing side of the ledger, that housing in many ways uh, for many people is, is, you know, is a top issue and a top priority, but also looking at neighborhood conditions. And so as you look at these priorities, again, they're really framed as much more of a kind of aspirational goal. You know, we want to develop medical legal partnerships. We want to improve vacant lots and infrastructure. So it helps kind of set the stage at this kind of strategic level. We also noticed that there were a number of hospitals out there that seemed to elevate housing. Uh, the Bon Secures Health Institutions, both in Baltimore, helped develop uh, through home ownership zones that were near uh, some of its uh, <clears throat> projects and some of its institutions in East Baltimore. So here again, trying to de actually develop housing that was supportive and a lot of different services, uh, healthcare services that were integrated into the housing, uh, housing development. They did something similar in Greenville with support from uh, design students from Clemson University to be able to, again, take the vision of housing and health and actually see it on the ground, in this case, helping develop 46 affordable units in Greenville County, along with the necessary health supports. Uh, Stanford Hospital in Connecticut, uh, Again, with extensive guidance from residents and business owners, they developed a mixed income neighborhood adjacent to the hospital that looked that some of those units were public housing units, some were urban farms, there were case management services. So this whole sort of 360 approach to the intersection of health and housing. Again, what we would say is these are still sort of the exceptions, not the rules, but you know, within the public health field, you can see housing percolating to the surface. Now on housing assessments, I know for many of you, this is familiar territory, right? You know about the 2015 rule from HUD. We know that that rule was, um, what would be a diplomatic way of saying? It? it was sort of recalibrated. It was kind of put on pause in the previous administration and the Biden administration is sort of, awakening it again. We know that some of the details are still to be determined, uh, but a number of communities have gone through this process of developing the assessment of fair housing. There's again, similar to the CHNAs, a lot of data analysis for, but through the housing lens um, and setting up some priorities and goals, uh, extensive public engagement. 
What's critical, I think, for both of these is the implementation plan that accompanies, in this case, the AFHA, either through HUD consolidated plans or housing elements, local housing policy and programs. You know, that's where the proverbial rubber meets the road. And that is similar to the CMHAs, is even once the plans have been formally submitted to the IRS and the healthcare institutions can essentially check that box, there is an implementation plan to say, okay, how are we going to achieve you know, the top three or four priorities? So that's in some ways where I see that there's an opportunity to build that bridge right between these two processes. Um, and one idea I have is whether health impact assessments can serve as that bridge. Um, I've been part of three health impact assessments that have looked at housing, zoning, and the built environment. Um, many of you who may be familiar with health impact assessments know of it being used when there's a particular development like maybe an infrastructure project like a bridge or a new development goes in and a health impact assessment happens uh, in order to, similar to an environmental impact assessment, figure out what the health impacts of that development may be for that community, for that neighborhood, for those individuals and families. But there's also HIAs that look what we call strategic policy HIAs that take a look at a proposed policy or a series of policies. So I do wonder in some ways whether the HIA process that goes through these essentially five stages of screening, scoping, analysis, reporting, if that could be a potential vehicle for building that bridge between health and housing, between the CHNA and the FHA processes. So lots of health impact assessments that are out there related to housing on uh, different housing policies. So you know, there is a community of practice uh, and I think it may show some promise and opportunity to help kind of connect the dots. So I will start, stop there and pause. And I'm not sure if there's opportunity for questions or just pass it on over uh, to start the conversation with James. Thank you, Joe. That was incredibly helpful context uh, to help all of us understand some of the planning opportunities that both housing and health stakeholders can leverage towards meeting the community's housing needs. And as someone who uh, has a public health background by training, but spent many, many years in a city hall, uh, overseeing the planning and urban development efforts. This intersection is something that's really close to my heart, so I really appreciate everyone joining us today. Uh, I'd now like to turn to our outstanding panel to talk more about this issue and, and what the work really looks like on the ground, so I'd invite them all to turn their cameras on and, and join us. I'm pleased to welcome uh, Debbie Goldberg, Vice President for Housing Policy and Special Projects at the National Fair Housing Alliance. Angela Mingo, Senior Director of Community Relations with Nationwide Children's Hospital, and Sandra Cerna, Director, Office of Health Equity with the Virginia Department of Health. Thank you, each of you, for joining us. And we'll begin, Angela, with you, uh, Nationwide Children's Hospital, which I'm an Ohio native, so uh, wonderful to have the Ohio representation today. But Nationwide Children's has really been a leader in taking on a more upstream approach uh, to healthcare, particularly through their CH CHNA, but even beyond the CHNA, addressing priorities such as safe and affordable housing. And I wonder if you could briefly describe how your work at Nationwide Children's has evolved in this area and the role that the community health needs assessment process plays in all of that. Well, James, thank you so much for having me today. It is a pleasure to be here with such an esteemed group of panelists. The work at Nationwide Children's Hospital in this affordable housing space began uh, back a decade plus ago when we were expanding our main campus and our campus facilities. And we looked out into our community and recognized that 
Our investment could not only be made on our campus proper, but also in the neighborhood in which we reside. And we noticed just a couple of things that were taking place around us. Uh, one, this was before we were uh, in, in, the, in the arena of healthcare, referring to those socioeconomic needs of our patient population as social determinants of health. However, we were keenly aware that there were some needs that were, that were immediate in our surrounding area. One, back in 2008 with our expansion of our facilities, we were just coming uh, upon the foreclosure crisis, um, not only here in Columbus, but across the nation. And that was very visible here in our immediate area with a number of vacant blighted uh, residential properties uh, just a stone's throw away from our campus. And so we recognized that if we wanted to be a leader in world-class pediatric health care, we have to make sure that we're looking at those socioeconomic needs of our community. And so we launched a neighborhood initiative called Healthy Neighborhoods, Healthy Families that was focused on five core areas of impact. Those core areas include a focus on education, working with our local Columbus City Schools to partner with schools to further the educational needs of the students who are also uh, a part of our patient population. Uh, we were also focused on economic development in the corridor. Oftentimes when we would talk about facilities expansion, uh, folks would respond not with questions about our facilities, but really with questions about how could they become employed uh, within our facilities? How could they seek and identify job opportunities? Uh, community enrichment was another area of focus, looking at how can we further uh, opportunities for the community to grow cohesively uh, and, and collectively as community civic leaders and stakeholders. Health and wellness, very much true and, and dear to, to the work that we do and at our core. And then affordable housing, again, looking at how can we address some of the housing needs within our community. We started with a focus on home ownership as well as home improvements for existing residents, because we knew that we wanted to help stabilize the housing corridor with the goal of stabilizing health. We knew that the two were integrally, integrally related. And as, it, as we look at the community health needs assessment, uh, what we've seen over the years since we've been doing this work for now for 14 years, is that the community health needs assessment has allowed us to help demonstrate this work. We were in this space prior to the community health needs assessment coming to fruition, and it really has helped to reinforce uh, and share and demonstrate publicly what it is we aim to do in this area of affordable housing. Our goal is to focus on mixed income communities, creating those mixed income communities by stepping in the space of affordable housing, and the community health needs assessment allows us to prioritize housing and demonstrate that prioritization through the community health needs improvement plan and also the implementation plan. So we can share who our partners are publicly and also share how we plan to implement the plan that's been created to help further affordable housing within our footprint. Such incredible work. And I know we'll come back to it and look forward to you sharing a little bit more. Sandra, I'd like to turn to you now, if I could. And uh, in your prior work, uh, before joining uh, Virginia Department of Public Health, you helped nonprofit hospitals with more limited resources to conduct community health needs assessments and help them to think about how to integrate housing needs into their community health implementation plans. And we heard from Joe that so many of these CHNAs are identifying affordable housing as a top concern, and yet they don't make it uh, to the to the final cut. And so I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about what steps you've seen hospitals take to overcome that barrier, to, to move from identifying housing as a need to actually addressing it, and particularly in those places where the financial resources just aren't as robust. Sure, thanks, James, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak here. So yes, in uh, a previous uh, job, I worked for the Louisiana Public Health Institute um, based in New Orleans, and we were often hired to conduct community health needs assessments for nonprofit hospitals across the Gulf Coast coast region. And in particular, they really, the, our clients, the hospitals really valued the qualitative expertise we brought to the table. So we would often conduct, you know, community meetings, uh, focus groups, 
uh, interviews with key stakeholders representing a variety of, of CBOs and, and churches in the community that really had a pulse on what the needs are. And, you know, oftentimes in resource constrained areas, you, you know, it's issue upon issue. It's lack, lack of jobs, uh, lack of educational opportunities, limited housing, poor quality housing, um, and that can be overwhelming. And so, but we were heartened to see, it, you know, one hospital um, in particular, Christus Oshner, um, Health Southwestern Louisiana based in Lake, Lake Charles in their 2017 community health needs assessment really listened to the public and listed housing as, as a, a prioritized need. They had mul a multitude of needs. Um, and, you know, one of the ways that at LPHI that we coached hospitals is understanding that you know, they they have their purview and, and especially if you're re resource constrained, you're, you're more concerned about maybe health education and um, indigent care and those costs. But, um, you know, there's tremendous opportunity. Um, hospital systems and often the, the folks in administration and, and the doctors and the nurses who serve the public, they carry um, an incredible prestige and really social capital, if you will, in the community. And so we, we told Christus at the time, like, here's an opportunity. You, we know and you know that your physicians see the needs when you have patients come through your doors and if they're not stably housed and, and you know what the connection between poor health and, and lack of affordable housing. And so there's tremendous opportunity to get involved, whether it's you know, having discussions with the mayor, which apparently they did back in the day, or approaching city council or participating in local groups that are interested in coalitions that are interested in increasing the affordable housing supply that has incredible cachet. So, you know, understanding they may not necessarily have the capital to contribute directly to increasing the affordable housing stock, but don't, you know, don't sell themselves short in missing that tremendous opportunity. Um, I saw in the most recent assessment, because I, I, you know, obviously since departed my position at LPHI, uh, which was uh, conducted for 2019 through uh, the next, you know, three years, that it didn't make, housing didn't make the, the top, they whittled it down to four. I think they really wanted to concentrate, which is fine, but they did acknowledge the work that they've done and, and did mention that when the opportunity arises, they, you know, they would continue to participate. So that's just one example um, that we, uh, you know, as a, uh, uh, a person who conducted these assessments really encouraged our clients to, to think of all the ways on the continuum you can contribute to the conversation. That's really helpful. And especially in those smaller places or places with limited resources, oftentimes the hospital is running a pretty narrow margin itself. And so trying to be creative in ways in which you approach it to get them involved in housing, I'm sure is, is pretty critical. And, and sort of building on that, we have a lot of housing practitioners on the webinar today. And this question is, is for um, you, Sandra and Angela as well. And I think one of their main questions is where do you start? Who do you call? How do you actually you know, get involved in a CHNA process if it's totally foreign to you or it's something you've been sort of adjacent to or aware of, but have never been uh, deeply involved. So I wonder if you if you both could just maybe give us your thoughts on how can um, folks in the housing field connect with their local uh, and regional healthcare providers that are doing their CHNAs. Angel or Sandra, go ahead. Oh, I, I was going to offer it to Angelo, but I'm happy to jump in whenever. <laughs> I'm happy to, to respond. You know, the one thing that we typically say here at Nationwide Children's is there's no wrong door of entry. Um, each hospital is uniquely different in terms of who internally does this level of work. And so I think whether it's a government relations department or community relations, um, trying to identify who 
uh, who is leading this work is the first step. And sometimes it may not be by working directly through the hospital. Uh, in the case of Nationwide Children's, we have a very strong partnership with a community development corporation that holds a CHOTO status. So they hold the community housing development organization status, which has been the enabler for us to, to conduct this work. Uh, and so, you know, I say that to share that the partnerships with community-based organizations is critical to this work. And so uh, either connecting through a CBO that's partnering with the hospital or reaching out to those external facing departments within the hospital, uh, both can serve as a port of entry into this work. Um, you know, another thing I would say is that when you're trying to understand what, you know, what is the area of interest or the area of focus for a hospital when it comes to what we typically refer to internally as the work of social determinants of health and looking at how we can impact social determinants of health, that's where the community health needs assessment can be very helpful because it does show and demonstrate the roadmap that the hospital has developed so that it can proceed with its planning process, as well as a listing of who the existing partners are in this work. And, and one of the things that we've learned here at Nationwide Children's is that if we truly wanna be effective in this space, we need strong partners. Uh, and we are always open to listening and learning what others are doing in the space. You know, we've we've developed a, a, a niche, if you will, in housing, but it certainly was not our strong suit when we first started out. And so being able to go out and learn from others in the housing and particularly the affordable housing space was a critical, uh, critical step for us to best understand what the needs were in the community uh, and what the needs were uh, geographically throughout Central Ohio, uh, because we were hearing from the community what they could see within, outside of their front door, within the space that they uh, they hold here in the neighborhood. Uh, but going beyond even our civic leaders and working with our housing membership organizations, our organized housing groups, really gave us a broader perspective on what some of those needs are and what they were locally when we started this work. And I'll just add that, you know, I'm pretty sure Joe covered this already, but the IRS requires hospitals to publicly post their CHNA and their implementation plan. So oftentimes you can go to a website, you can look for community investment, uh, community engagement. Like Angela mentioned, sometimes it's under government relations. A lot of times with, uh, with the um, parochial or Catholic hospitals, it's mission integration because it's very close to and aligned with, the, with their mission of, of being stewards of the community. Um, the other thing I'll say is, you know, don't forget, and I'd be remiss if I didn't say this, don't forget about your health departments. Um, the, even though they have, they certainly, as the pandemic has proven, they have a million things they're trying to do and hats to wear, but the um, CHNA process outlined by the IRS does require um, hospitals to bring in folks with public health expertise, and oftentimes the state and local health departments will be engaged on some level. So, you know, you if you happen to have a good relationship already with your public health department, they may be able to direct you to the appropriate person. And they also have lots of data around the social determinants of health that can be helpful in making your case when approaching a hospital system. Super helpful, thank you. So I wanna pivot, um, uh, but I building off of what Sandra said, Debbie, and come to you. Uh, when I hear Sandra say public health department, I think local government. And, and we've been talking a lot about sort of the local community health planning, but let's pivot to the local housing planning process. And given all the commonalities that we've identified between community health needs assessment and fair housing planning processes, the National Fair Housing Alliance has raised the idea of bringing health and housing stakeholders together to better align these efforts for greater impact. So could you talk to us a little bit about this idea of bringing those stakeholders together and ways that city governments can play that facilitation, that convening role to really energize both of these processes, but also these groups of stakeholders to come together for the greater good? Right, happy to do that and happy to be there. So I, I want to start by, um, by saying thanks for the invitation to be part of this conversation. 
So just um, to kind of level set for a moment, you know, when Lori gave her introduction at the beginning about our Keys Unlock Dreams initiatives, one of the things that she touched on that I just want to emphasize, and my co-panelists have talked about this a little bit as well, is that, you know, the pandemic that we are going through um, really, I think, kind of roll, pulled back the curtain on the incredibly close connection there is between housing and health in so many different ways, right? And, and also the disparities there are in terms of who has access to what kind of housing where and what implications does that have for the health, you know, in a pandemic or when there's not a pandemic, right? Um, and so, um, while we might think of health and housing in some ways as being separate fields, there is obviously a very close connection um, that has become very clear, I think, to, to all of us. And so at NAFA, since part of our goals with Keys Unlocked Dreams is to ensure that we have an equitable recovery from the pandemic, knowing that its impact has bright on certain people in certain communities. And we wanna make sure that those communities aren't left behind as we exit this pandemic and get back to something that looks more like normal. Um, and we know that that takes deliberate steps, right? And it seems like um, understanding that there are these two processes out there that are in many ways are focused on the same people, the same communities and the same issues that finding ways to align those two um, makes a lot of sense. And I just have to say, you know, as someone who's not a health practitioner at all, the first time that I heard somebody talk about community health needs assessments and the social determinants of health, it was at a conference. And I actually thought for a second I had wandered into the wrong room because it seemed like a panel about fair housing and that, you know, the speaker was talking about the issues that we consider when doing fair housing planning, which goes beyond just thinking about the barriers that people may face in getting access to housing based on their race or national origin or sex or because they have kids or they have a disability, to thinking about these kind of systemic barriers that prevent equitable access to opportunity and that lead to the disparate impacts on certain people's um, health and lives that we've seen, you know, the, the pandemic kind of um, uh, illustrates so starkly. So, you know, in, in the health field, I know that people recognize that a zip code, you know, there's this kind of, I don't know what the right word for it is, um, uh, aphorism or something that, that uh, a person's zip code is more important in determining their health outcomes than their genetic code, right? And in the fair housing world, we also recognize that your zip code matters because it determines so many things about your life. And so since these two concepts are so closely aligned, although they come from different sources, right? The IRS and the American um, CARES Act and uh, the Affordable CARES Act, pardon, pardon me, and the, see, I'm not a health practitioner, <laughs> and the Fair Housing Act and HUD and kind of the fair housing planning process, right? So they're two separate and two, right now, two siloed processes, but they are closely aligned and we need to be looking for ways to bring those two together. And I would just close by saying that at, right now, I think that alignment is more the exception than it is the rule. Um, and that city officials can be a bridge between the two communities, right? City officials who are aware of, and at one level or another involved in both can really help bring those two sets of really overlapping stakeholders together so that these processes can align better. The perspectives from each can, be, can help inform the other and hopefully the outcomes then um, really maximize the impact and the resources that each process brings to bear. So I think um, I kind of on a very pragmatic level, you know, the city officials, and this maybe assumes that the housing folks and the public health folks at the city level actually talk to each other. So that maybe is the first step, but they can really help each set of stakeholders understand the other process, alert them to when it's taking place, when that planning process is taking place, help invite them or get them invited into that process, um, you know, bring the information that each process um, entails into the other uh, uh, and, and help make sure that the recommendations of each are, are aligned in ways that really maximize their benefits. That's great. And as you said, Debbie, there's, there's these are really for better or worse. And unfortunately it, it's, it's become a real challenge. These are two very different stakeholder communities between health and housing. They have different cultures, they have different language, they have different professionals and training. So Angela, I wonder, um, I go to you for a moment and just ask, you know, what are some of the strategies that you've seen and that you've uh, deployed at Nationwide to bridge these differences between the different sectors, housing and health, uh, in order to improve the overall health of the community? 
Debbie really hit the nail on the head when she spoke about how local government can play a role in the in the example of Nationwide Children's Hospital, we were introduced to our Community Development Corporation partner, uh, which is a joint owner in our housing development work by the city of Columbus. And so it truly was the city understanding and recognizing some of what we had aimed to do as we were focused on population health and a very place-based uh, corridor within the immediate area surrounding the hospital. And they were, they were also aware of others, our CDC partner, uh, who were doing very similar work in the same corridor, also place-based. And so, you know, what I would say is that it's really a, a matter of identifying what are those shared priorities. One group may be calling it economic development, stewardship, community development, uh, that would be our CBOs in the space of healthcare. We're referring to social determinants of health. Again, going back to Debbie's uh, comment about zip codes matter mattering. You know, we know that for the, those of us in healthcare, a child's zip code could be a greater definer of their health outcomes than their genetic code. Um, that is something we often talk about. Uh, and our partners in housing are having those same conversations about low to moderate income census tracts within zip codes. And so really starting to create a jargon buster, if you will, and breaking down the jargon and really getting to what that common denominator is across the sectors is the first step. Um, you know, we here in healthcare now, we are very much engaged in the housing sector as it relates to housing membership organizations. And so we're, we're crossing over, if you will, to better understand the broader housing issues in our surrounding area. And we, we can only do that best by identifying who are those partners, what are those organizations that we need to be attuned um, about in understanding the broader picture that helps to complement our work. Um, and so, you know, I think for us being able to, to break down those silos and really understanding that we all have very similar, if not the exact same outcomes, um, the path to get there uh, can be united, which really helps to accelerate the work within both sectors and ultimately create even better outcomes across the board. Absolutely. And Sandra, similar question for you. I think we've heard a theme now that um, City Hall can be a really important intermediary to bring these two stakeholder groups together. But I wonder if you've seen other uh, sort of Switzerland-like organizations uh, that have played that role in, in communities. And then what have been those really important first, second, third steps that housing and, and health stakeholders can do that you've seen that can really start them down the path of common ground. Yeah, I mean, you know, to Angela's point about the jargon buster, I just want to give a shout out to the Build Healthy Places Network. They actually have a jargon buster tool, which I think we're speaking to majority housers, so they probably are already familiar with that. But um, you know. It, I always tell folks, whoever I work with, like, let's not reinvent the wheel, right? So if it already exists that, you know, we're all busy, we, we're all, you know, doing a million things at once, you know, leveraging those tools. Um, you know, prior to coming to the Virginia Department of Health, I worked for Stewards of Affordable Housing for the Future, and one of our members, community housing partners, um, they were able to, you um, open up an on-site health services suite in one of their properties in Baltimore through rich partnerships with a multitude of systems, as well as the University of Maryland Nursing School. And I know various CBOs were engaged with that. So it really depends. Prior um, to LPHI, I worked at United Way Worldwide, and we were familiar with United Ways who were engaged in, in the CHNA process. In fact, you know, bringing there's one instance I can recall of 
um, the hospital systems, the two that exist in a particular jurisdiction didn't necessarily have the friendliest uh, relationship, but they trusted the United Way CEO and, and they came together around an initiative. So there was you know, great opportunity there. Um, the other thing is I know that um, CHP community housing partners, they, you know, as they're cultivating these partnerships of various health systems in, in their footprint, um, they have shared, you know, th they came to SAFE asking for advice and um, together we pulled some resources from the Healthcare Anchor Network. Another shout out, they have a place-based investment toolkit because um, a, a hospital system in Virginia that um, CHP was having these discussions, they weren't sure where to start and they really wanted to know, well, what are our peers doing? And, and not the peers that are the gold standard because we realize that we you know we need baby steps like bond secures you know nationwide y'all are amazing kaiser permanente out out in california you know those are the gold standard and that is so aspirational that's what people want to get to but if i'm just starting what what are the resources i need so we um connected them with some of the resources from the health care anchor network and it, it really gets the discussion going on that that's fantastic and actually makes me think of angela one of the uh, comments you made that you know nationwide now is held up as a gold standard but they started in the same place that many health systems are in terms of what what do we do with affordable housing and so it, it doesn't necessarily uh, just because your local health uh, system doesn't have a background in it doesn't mean they can't they can't reach an incredible level of support. So Debbie, I, I'd love to um, come back to you for a moment and talk a little bit about uh, the issue of equity. Given that fair housing advocates and those that NAFA serves are, are focused on eliminating housing discrimination and expanding access to housing opportunity, uh, that would seem to me to be clear alignment with those in the health field that are looking to eliminate health disparities and and the social and improve the social determinants of health. So what opportunities do you see for fair housing and health equity stakeholders uh, to come together? Do you think that there's a great opportunity for them to maybe even lead or, or begin a larger or broader equity push within their communities by coming together? Absolutely. You know, I want to respond to that, but let me just back up for one second and um, speak to a couple of issues that have come up earlier, if I could. One is that, um, uh, you know, under the fair housing planning that that we do in this country is not just focused on income. You know, it stems from the Fair Housing Act, which prohibits discrimination based on race and national origin, five other categories that I won't list. <laughs> but um, I, I just want to make a really important distinction here. I, I'm not quite sure how this plays out in the health field, but, you know, one of the things that we see in the housing world is that um, people who are not low and moderate income, but people of color in particular, um, you know, face barriers in terms of the housing opportunities available to them and a wealth of other opportunities available to them that are not based on their income, right? It's based more on race and national origin. And so um, I think the focus in fair housing planning is a little bit broader than low and moderate income. And that's really important because I think the potential that you know, people or neighborhoods of color that are not low income, that are moderate income or middle income, or maybe even higher income may still have conditions that are detrimental in terms of health outcomes. You know, that's a factor I think we need to keep in mind and the fair housing planning framework allows us to do that. The second thing is that um, the fair housing planning framework applies to, first of all, all of a jurisdiction's housing and community development resources, regardless of their source, local, federal, HUD, you know, elsewhere. So it's quite a broad array of, of resources and the planning process allows them to identify really as many priorities as they want. So I've listened to my co-panelists here talk about some of the constraints in the health planning process, right? It sounds like you come up with three or four priorities, you know, it's the resources under the control of the institution. Um, and that may be discouraging from a perspective of trying to do something in the housing arena, but I think plugging into this fair housing planning process can help overcome the, um, those limitations. So really quickly, because I know we, we have to keep an eye on the clock here, I kind of see three levels at which um, 
health equity and fair housing um, or housing equity stakeholders can be working together. One is sort of at the planning level. So we've talked about that a lot in this webinar, webinar so far, right? The two different planning processes that go on. And I think for each sector to be involved in the other's planning um, could really uh, be beneficial you know, on both sides of the, of the ledger, really to um, make sure that plans are coordinated, that there's collaboration where that's possible to kind of maximize the leverage of, of each. The second level I would say is really kind of the policy level because there are a gazillion kinds of policy decisions, right? That localities make that have an impact on health and health equity, as well as housing opportunity. And by working together, I think it was Sandra who said that, you know, one of the lessons that, that they tried to teach to um, the heads of, of the hospitals was how much political cachet they carry in the community. You know, having health um, professionals involved in the fair housing planning and maybe vice versa, just I think can, can be really, really impactful. And um, just one example I would give right now is a uh, priority in the fair housing world is to make, uh, is to prohibit discrimination against individuals based on their source of income which could be a lot of different kinds of source of income. But one that um, is, I would highlight is for folks who get housing assistance from the federal government. So housing choice vouchers, what, you know, what we used to think of as, as section eight. And there are a lot of landlords who will refuse to rent to people who are voucher holders. And that in turn severely constrains the kind of housing that people can get access to and where that housing is located. And so in these efforts to get what we call source of income protection, you know, built in at the local or state level, having the health community involved in that um, debate and, you know, to be able to talk about the health impacts and what that means overall for the kind of general health of the community, I think could be really, really powerful. And then the last thing I would say is just on individual projects or programs that a community may be considering where, you know, it may be a housing project or something else altogether, but where there are health implications. And so again, having housing folks and health folks together to weigh in on the specifics of a project, I think can be, um, can be very helpful and can really help make sure that any project or any program that this jurisdiction undertakes is carried out in a way that's gonna best advance both kinds of equity goals. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Debbie. I, uh, I wanna, with the time we have left, I'd love to get some audience questions in. So I'll begin with, with this one, how can we ensure that communities are genuinely included at the table in these uh, respective planning processes and that community engagement is not just a check the box activity? And Angela, I may kick that over to you first, maybe to talk about how nationwide, but even any examples of how you ensure that it's not um, cookie cutter or just check the box, that it really is meaningful and ongoing. Sure. One of the things that we've done in our community health needs assessment process is we've engaged an organized group here at the Hospital of Community Stakeholders through a neighborhood advisory committee. And so when we are going through the process of developing our CHNA, we make certain that part of that process includes the group, the community advisory group, so that they can hear about what we are doing, uh, what those priorities, uh, what they are, how they've been identified, uh, and then seek their feedback and input on what they've heard and what they've learned. Um, I, you know, I would also share that uh, our CHNA is done in partnership with three adult hospital systems here locally, uh, and so they are they are following a very similar process with community stakeholders, making sure that civic stakeholders, civic leaders are part of that conversation. And so by doing that collectively, we feel like this is one enabling step to make sure that the discussions we're having around the table with our local health department uh, and amongst ourselves as part of this process gets carried out into the communities that we serve. Um, you know, it's something else I would just add is that what we hear through our membership organizations also helps to inform the priorities that we set forth as it relates to those priorities of the community health needs assessment. So uh, really understanding the environment uh, through those membership organizations, working with public uh, officials and local municipalities uh, is another way that we can engage the community in a broader way. Thank you. Sandra, this one, this is a good one for you. Are local hospitals, small rural area, 
are very anxious about getting asked to get involved in developing housing units as part of their community benefit requirement. Do you have examples, and I know you had already given some, but um, talk a little bit more even about how uh, this questioner might approach a smaller rural hospital and how to get them involved or leverage their, uh, their capacity for housing. Well, I think it goes back to clear, honest communication and, and having patience. So understanding that, you know, if you're a housing organization, you're very eager to get involved with them, but having that conversation and also asking them, you know, what are your priorities? Obviously do your homework, like we've recommended, you know, try to find their CHNAs on the website if you're able to do so look at community grants so it may not necessarily be tied to the chna but what what other things do they seem to invest in and i think you know be understanding and and talk about the dialogue and i and i think with any partnership it's about um indicating what you know each party can bring to the table so you know obviously you may be wanting to go for that to them to see I don't, I don't know if it's capital that, that they're looking for, that might not be a, a likely outcome, or it could just be, you know, their expertise and, and, to, and to speak on something, but they may want to know, you know, what, what are you offering them and what, what is mutually beneficial? And I think, you know, there's, there's different, um, hospitals have different priorities. We've talked about that already, whether it's, you know, to, to have the, the social capital to be, and um, I didn't go over this, but when I talked about the healthcare anchor network, you know, essentially being they're an anchor institution, the main employer. And that is certainly the truth about rural hospitals. They are probably far and away going to be the largest employer um, in, a, in a several mile radius. Um, and just seeing what, you know, what, what do they want to bring to, um, um, could, you know, enhance their reputation and, and job retention. I mean, that may be an interest you don't know. Don't make assumptions, I think, is another um, good tip to have. Just, you know, try, try. I, I will say most of the partnerships that I have seen um, during my time at SAFE or, uh, you know, before that, these relationships take time. So it needs, it needs a lot of time and, and patience. Um, to really get that that reward and the mutual benefit. That's great. I would also point uh, Center for Community Investment has some really good uh, has put out some really good stuff around how to get hospitals involved um, without just asking for money uh, to get their get their other things. Debbie, I'm going to give you the last uh, uh, com community question we have here. How do you deal with the NIMBYs, the neighborhood defenders? How do you how do you what <laughs> strategies? Have you seen uh, where, where we can get after that? <laughs> so this is the question we're going to tackle in the last two minutes of the webinar. <laughs> yeah, you get two minutes, right? You could do this in two minutes, sure. You know, um, I actually think um, you're kind of going back to the social capital issue. That I mean, there, you know, there's no simple strategy. Maybe that's the, the starting point. Um, but you know, helping people understand. Um, and, and also I would say, you know, NIMBY, the potential for NIMBY covers a lot of, a lot of territory, right? It could be NIMBYism about a lot of things, but, um, you know, helping people understand the benefits of the kind of, if we're talking about a housing development, the kind of housing development that's being proposed, um, you know, for uh, the community overall, for the economic and other health of the community, I think is one starting point. Um, I think uh, you know having a broad partnership in support of whatever to, whatever kind of development we're talking about that includes folks. You know, this is another place, right, where you have folks from the housing world and folks from the um, the health world, and potentially to go back to Sandra's point about hospitals being big employers, you know, other employers in the area um, jumping on board to say, you know, we need this kind of housing for our employees so that we can keep our businesses running effectively and profitably. You know, the more kind of partners that you can bring in, I think the better. And the and I think the the healthcare world can be extremely influential and extremely helpful in in bringing in a wider array of um, of supporters for a proposed housing development. And then I think you know, telling the story, assuming that you can be successful, making sure people know that in fact the sky did not fall when we built that mixed income you know, development and you know, the roads did not clog up instantly and all the other arguments that uh, folks who sometimes afford, uh, excuse me, oppose these kinds of developments are likely to bring out, you know, showing that in fact, 
that's not what really happens and the benefits that that flow from the kinds of projects that we're talking about. Thank you so much. And I, I, I know I speak on behalf of all of our participants today when I thank each of you for giving up your time and talent and expertise uh, with us today. So thank you. I just want to remind everybody real, really quick that you will receive a follow-up email with both the recording of this webinar, this session, as well as additional uh, related resources. And we are so, so happy that you joined us today. And so on behalf of NAFA, National Fair Housing Alliance, as well as um, local housing solutions and NYU firm. And we really appreciate you joining us today. Take care.